Good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, February 6, 2007. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus, and today we are privileged to have with us Joseph C. Clements. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, may I ask you, Joe, when you were born? I was born January 15, 1926. So happy birthday. You just Thank had you a very birthday. Much. I just had a birthday. And where were you born? I was born in the city of New Orleans, Louisiana. And you currently live in Massachusetts where? I'm at, and I live in Needham, Massachusetts. I'm at Avery Cross. And it's existing living. And um, you are married? I am married. And your wife's name? Imelda Clements. Imelda F. Clements. And do you have children? We have none. No children. Mm -hmm. um, where and when did you enter the military? I entered the military in the city of, from the city of New Orleans. What State year? 42. How old were you at that time? I was 18 years old, 19 years, I'm sorry, 19 years old. Had you completed high school? I had not. Mm -hmm. Did you leave high school at an early age? I did. What age did you leave high school? I left uh, high school at about uh, seven, 16, 16 years old. And were you working at the time? Prior I was, to joining the service? I was in a trade school, welding school. Why did you uh, decide to join, and what, what branch did you decide to join, and why? I did not decide on joining, I was drafted. You were drafted. Yes, okay. And when you were drafted, were friends of yours from your area also drafted? A few of them was that I seen by by by. And what um, branch of the service were you drafted into? I was into? drafted into the Army. Were you comfortable with that? I was very comfortable because I, I, I had loved the service. I wanted to be. I really tried. I tried to be in the Navy, but I was rejected from being in the Navy. So I, went in, I was drafted into the Army. And you mentioned some friends. Were any of them drafted in the Army with you? They was drafted, you know, but I met them at the Army basic uh, camp. And what, where was your basic? My basic camp was in, I cannot remember the name of it. Do you remember what, what state it was in? It was the state of Louisiana. In Louisiana, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. uh-huh. And what, do you remember what it was like being in basic training? It was, it was wonderful trying to learn to know what to do. And I, I was the type of fellow who loved to be in the service. I, I loved it. I had nothing against being in the service. When, back in the 40s, and you're in Louisiana, and you're drafted into the service, into the Army, you're in basic training, mm -hmm. what was the makeup of the group that you were with? Was it mostly a black group or was it a mixed race group? It was mostly a black group. Mm -hmm. Was that the norm back then? It was. And there was not a problem with that? Not to me. Mm -hmm. And what about your officers and your basic training um, senior seniority individuals? My officers was white. Uh, and Mexican. My officer was named Lieutenant Daniel J. Hogan, Ben Hogan. He was, a, and then had another lieutenant, uh, Mexican, Lieutenant uh, Rodari, uh, Mexican. And did they treat you respectfully? Very well. Mm -hmm. Very and well. how long was your basic training? Do you remember? My basic training was six weeks of basic. And during that training, did you um, advance to any specialized training or special programs? None. No, I did not try to no, not special. And what was your first duty station after basic training? 
my first duty station for Fort Francis Iwari in Wyoming. Now was that kind of interesting to you? Had you traveled at all or was Wyoming one of your first places to travel to? I had traveled before because I was living in Sacramento, California before I went into the service. I stayed out there 11 months and working at McCullen Air Force Base and also picking tomatoes. On farms back then? On the then? farm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, you, did you branch out to the West Coast by yourself or did you? I go, did. You I did. went out there by myself. I had just turned 18 when my grandfather helped me to get out there. How did you get there? On a train. When you were stationed at, say, at Fort Francis, and you said that was in Wyoming? In Wyoming. Mm -hmm. Were you sent there individually or as part of a unit? We were sent there as a unit. How many were in your unit approximately? Oh, we had a whole big company. We had, we had four different companies in there. There were so many units there that I really can tell you how many were there. So we're talking hundreds? Oh yes, mm -hmm. there was quite a few. And again, was your unit still basically, um, was it segregated from the rest of the units or was it just segregated in its makeup? We were just segregated in makeup in the different companies. And we had four, four uh, uh, four platoons and a, one platoon in each company, and it took, had about four different companies into there. And when you went to Fort Francis, what were your responsibilities there? We had just a little uh, skirmish, like going to Camp, Camp Grizzly out there into the mountains and training and learning how to, how to detect mines and uh, different things, and uh, oh, it was just a basic training out there in the field for a couple of days. And then from there, where did you go? From there, we went to Camp Jersey in, in uh, Jersey City, we went out there. Jersey City, mm -hmm. New Jersey? New Jersey. And what was your specialty there? We just stayed there a while because we went to Fort, uh, Camp Shank in New York. We left from there and went to Camp Shank in New York. And from Camp Shank, New York, we went overseas. And where overseas did you go to? We went over first into England, and then we went over into France. So when you're in England and France, what do you remember what year that was? Was that? that was in 43. In 43 we went. And into the part of 44. 43 and 44. Mm -hmm. Did you did you take a ship over? We took the Queen Mary. We went over on the Queen Mary. We stayed out in the water from New York into uh, for 13 days on the boat. How was that? What kind of experience was that for you? It was very exciting trying to learn to, to round inside that ship. It was so great, so big, so large. It was, uh, it was to me, I enjoyed it. A lot of fellows were sick, but I enjoyed it. I didn't, I wasn't did sick. Yeah. Um, once in England and France, what was happening in the war at that time? Do you remember? The war was still being, the Germans were still being pushed back from France. When we was in England, we went over from England into France, they were still being pushed back into Germany. And it was, it was good, it was exciting. And it was, to me, it was uh, you know, something different to know of survival. Now, when you mentioned that and them being pushed back, were, were any of your units involved in any type of combat? Uh, some units was. Not all, not all black units was in into these. 
you had some that was pushed back, some was in a trucking outfit, some was bringing up materials to the front. And what specifically was your unit doing? My unit was a basic uh, trucking outfit, bringing food, getting this into the warehouse. But, uh, Did you have any close calls at that time? We had a strafing from a German uh, uh, plane. But outside of that, that's about all we have had. I, I didn't go into actually no conflict with the, in the Army. During the breakthrough at the Rhine, we was back where we just had 11. We had no comp, we had no. The average Negro soldiers did not get into actual combat war, except maybe the tank division from Fort uh, Wachuca or the 49th from Fort Wachuca. Now why was that? Why didn't you go Segregation into... held us back. It did. It was segregation that held average Negro soldier back from doing what he could have maybe did to help. But that was the laws of the land. Was it frustrating to you and some of the other members of your unit? Did you talk about it amongst yourselves? We had a lot of discussions and a lot of talk about why we could not be into the action. But our also our outfits was well what you say, brainwashing to to, to do we just couldn't do it. You just couldn't get in there like you wanted to. There was some that had. Some fellows lost their lives trying to show them that they could be soldiers. But it, that was a, it's just that one way. But that's the way it was at that time at in your that life. Time. Um, did you still feel, though, that as a soldier, black or white, as a soldier, you were doing your duty. Did you feel that way while you were over there? I did. Mm -hmm. I did. What other things besides trucking did you do? Do you remember? We had, we, we didn't have, we didn't have uh, but that outfit, one outfit then. Like I said, I was attached to an outfit which you called a grave outfit, but we didn't stay with them too long till we moved. And it's called the gray? It's just GR, gray registration. Gray registration. Explain that to those watching this tape, what the gray registration unit did. Gray registration was soldiers they sent out to get the bodies that was dead or dying. They're taking the tags off their necks and put onto the rifle or one onto their toes and put them in the bags. And then zip that up and bring that out. Was that difficult for you at that time? I'm assuming you're only 20 or 21 years old. Was that hard for you to do? It, it was, it was a, something that I had never really did to touch a dead person or dying person to know that they was dead. And when you turn them over, they went, Oof. And this made you wonder if they were still dead, but there was dead air just in their stomach. Mm -hmm. But it, army life to me was good. I loved the army. Mm -hmm. I really did. Did you feel that after a certain period of time in helping retrieve these dead bodies that the initial shock wore off and you just treated it as the job that you had to do? That's all. Mm -hmm. While you were over there, do you remember, because you're in Europe and you're in areas of Europe that you've probably, have you ever been back there since then? I have never So been this gone. is your first trip over t to Europe. This is my first trip What do you remember to about it, the, um, the climate and the terrain or things like that? The climate in England was cloudy, always cold at night. It was foggy, and it was a racial section, the part that you didn't go into or you didn't get here. 
You couldn't go into some of the clubs because of the racial. France, you did, you traveled a little more. But there was still a tension among the black soldiers and the, 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 the different nationalities of people. And you had to put up with what was given to you and what was told to you to do. You had white MPs who didn't want you there, didn't want you doing this, didn't want you doing that. Did you ever have any run-ins with the MPs? We did. We had a run-in in with them in Fort Francis E. Warren. We had, a, uh, we had some conflicts with some in Cheyenne. Why, I mean, we had, we had a lot of conflicts with white and blacks. It, at that time, that racial tension was so tight, it just took a little movement for someone to go back and do something. Uh, knowing that that type of tension can cause a little, I use the term chippiness, on the part of either white or black GIs, were you chippy, or were you one of the ones who tried to calm your other friends down? H how did you react when you, you felt that perhaps the tensions were not reasonable? My, my way was, let it be, and Stay out the way of, of a problem. Stay out of the way. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. I stayed out the way of a problem by when they said, go to the left, I went to the left. Went to the right, went to the right. I did not want to get out to service with a blemish. Sure. I wanted to get out to service that I served, even though I knew it was a racial service. And that was my part of life. So I didn't try to change nobody's mind. So you were more accepting, perhaps, I accepted. of your circumstances? I was. Mm -hmm. How long were you in the gray registration unit? I didn't stay in there too long. I might have been in there about three months, four months, before I moved into uh, Czechoslovakia. We went over into Czechoslovakia. And I stayed over there in Prague and Pilsen, Czechoslovakia for about four to five months. And when you were in Prague, what did you do on an average daily basis? We had nothing, nothing but a little training, all the little exercise or movies. Or, Oh, nothing. We was more so moved out of a city into the suburbs of Czechoslovakia, where there was hardly any of the white nationalities of the females. So we was pushed back where that's where we was. We were segregated from the city all the time. Was this at the request of the Czechoslovakians, or was this? No, this was request of the of the American Army. Okay. This was army. So you were there for four or five months. Mm -hmm. The war was beginning to subside. Subsided to four to five. And where, did you stay in Europe for any length of time after that, or did no, you come I back did home? No, I did not. When I got this job, when I got over there, sent me over back to to the United States, I went into uh, in New York, and then I went over into Camp Shelby, Mississippi. Was it a comfort level for you to be back in the area where you grew up, more or less Mississippi, Louisiana? Well, it was a, a, it was a happy time coming back home, but I was told on the boat coming home that I was going back to the South. And I had to remember that that's why I was in the South before I went up into England or any of foreign countries. I'm going back home to a segregated city, state, 
and I have to remember that. And I am a Negro and have to go back as a Negro. Mm -hmm. Not as a U.S. Army. Not as an Army man. What, Not was, as, what was your rank at that point? I was in time. a private. Mm -hmm. So you went back to segregation. Mm -hmm. What did you do then? Did you stay in the service? No, I got out. When did you leave the service? I left the service in 46. I was discharged, honorably discharged from the Army. I was discharged at Fort Shelby, Mississippi. So you were discharged from the Army. You had an honorable discharge. Remember. What did you do next in your life? Tried to get a job to see if I could survive. Jobs was not being given like it was, unless she was a get out on a river to a longshoreman, maybe. There was some jobs that was there. But if you had education in the South, they had post office, school teachers, truckers, but you didn't have the type of job that you would maybe be qualified for because it was not you. You could drive the elevator in a building, be a maintenance man or pole or whatever you wanted. So but segregation limited you to what you could do even though you it, were, were um, honorably discharged from the Army? It did. So what did you do? Just went on with any little job I could find and could try to survive. When you came home, did you discuss with your family about your service and what you did? No, I did not, because I lived with my grandmother and grandfather, and it was of a, not of old age, but it was just not to, you to sit down and talk to at so that point. And my brothers went into the service after that. I had three brothers who went into the service after that. Did they experience the same segregation that you experienced? Or? They did, because they lived with me in the South. Mm -hmm. Once you... Um, left the Army and you said you picked up small jobs here and there. At that point in time, were you married or had you met your wife I, yet? I had, was not married. I met my wife in 47 and I married her in 49. We got married. We've been married now 56 years. Well, congratulations. 57 years, coming July the 50 to be 57. That's wonderful. I met my wife at a picnic and and we at school called Gaudette, and I got married. At that point in time, what were you doing for work? I was working at the New Orleans Public Service. That was at the 3700 block of Tulane Avenue in New Orleans, Louisiana. I was making $35 a week. And what did you do there? I was a porter. I'm sorry? A porter. A porter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you join any veterans organizations? Never did. No. Did you keep in touch with any of the individuals you were in the service with? I didn't keep in touch with them, but I met a few off and on. Driving trucks, I met a few here and there. How important was the serv service, your military service, to you? What, what did it what did it help? Did it help you as you got older in life? It it did. It made me very happy to know that I went into the service because now that I am blind, I receive compensation from the Veterans Administration from from the government for the loss of my sight. But I did not lose my sight in the service. How did you lose your sight? I lost my sight from glaucoma. And how old were you when you I lost your sight? I was in my 30s. Oh I was quite young. Yeah. And I'm classified as a non-service connected veteran from a wound. So they have helped you in that respect with they your medical care? Me. The government has helped me greatly. And do you do, do you go to veterans hospitals for your I care? I go to the VA hospital in New Orleans on Padilla Street. 
and the VA hospital served you well? Served me very well. I had one of the greatest assistants in a fellow by the name of Guy Lunn. All we have for the blind, he's a very wonderful fellow. Now tell the audience that is listening to this, what brought you from New Orleans to the Boston area, and when? It was September of last year, not last year, before last. i have been here a year and six months. I came here for Katrina. I left New Orleans that Tuesday afternoon. Mon Sunday evening we went, uh, Sunday morning, at quarter to 10, we went to the New Orleans Superdome. A friend of mine, across the street from my brought us there, my wife and I. She was in a wheelchair. And he made us come and we went to the dome. We stayed at the dome over Sunday night, which the storm came up. My wife wanted to go home, but I told her she couldn't go home because she couldn't get out there. There's water, army was around. Now, when you say home, did you have a house or an apartment? Or? We had a house. And how large was your house? Our house is a double. It's a two-room, three-room house. Mm -hmm. And the water was up to the door knob on the inside. Mm. And uh, we got out, we went into the Superdome, and then we stayed there. And then we went over to Fort, uh, um, uh, Texas there. Mm -hmm. he was, and Houston Astrodome, and then we called a cousin of ours who was in California, and she related the call to a cousin of ours who was in Needham, Needham, Massachusetts. He went for Boston College. So he called and told us to come on over there, which we thought we was going to lodge with him, but he put us over in this nursing home. And we stayed there, and we were very comfortable there, very, very wonderful service. So you're in the home that you're currently in no. through one of your cousins. Through her, her cousin. Mm -hmm. Many of us in the North have seen some of the um, tapes and videos mm -hmm. of the aftermath of Katrina and conditions in the Superdome and in the Astrodome. Tell us what it was like for you and your wife, especially both of you having issues, you with issues with your sight and your wife with a wheelchair. What, what was it like for you? My point is I could not see it. I could feel it. I could hear it. I could smell it. But I couldn't see it. I seen the destruction of the people in the dorm doing the things. I've seen how the people was uncontrollable, don't demand it. I've seen how I, I was told how food was scattered all into the bathroom. Excuse me, the feces and all that was over. And the thing that did me was I couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. All I could do was feel it. I could hear it. I was on the, on the bus coming from the dorm going to Houston Astrodome. And everybody on that bus seems to want to jump up and say, they found God. Maybe it did, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But this is a time everybody seems to confess what it was right about. And I was more worried about my wife than I was by myself because I found my wife some medical aid. I went on to the opposite side. The people want to know how did I get there not being able to see it. But I just managed it. I'm not going to say a God and angel brought me over there. My legs brought me over there, but I just had to get some help for her. Mm -hmm. She threw up. She was sick. She went into a little coma, a little diabetic sickness, not a coma. And I had two friends over there. One name was Dan. I mean, Fred, and then a lady named Joyce. Fred is a white guy. He came to my aid, took me to the bathroom, seen that I took a bath, changed clothes, shaved, and everything. And I asked him, I said, how come you take it to like me? He said, I like your smile. <laughs> and that's why I picked you. Yeah. And my wife, this lady helped my wife take a bath. 
And where was that? Was that? That was in, in Houston. In Houston. After dawn. And how long were you in Houston before you we came to Needham? We stayed there two days or so. And then how did you get to Needham? We got to Needham by airplane. Mm -hmm. My cousin sent to add two tickets to Houston, and we got there, and we went, came over to, to the airport here, and then he came pick us up and brought us over there. And I enjoyed it. Have you heard from friends back in New Orleans many, as to many, many. now what about your old homestead? Is it unreparable or is it um, I don't even know if that's a word or has it been repaired? Is it livable? My house that I live in is beautiful. It's a double brick. Nothing is wrong with the outside structure. Everything is wrong is an inside. Mm -hmm. The water soak is walls. The furniture that I had from when I got married a bed is gone. They threw it all out. Mm -hmm. Cabinets on the wall that I had in the bathroom was stolen and taken off. I've lost, we lost everything from the bridal pictures, the wedding pictures, everything. But, say, like the people say in Florida, that can be replaced. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad that my wife and I are alive. That's what I thank God for many days, that she's alive, that I'm alive. Well, she's sick. I'm sick. She's had strokes, diabetes, pressure, this and that, amputee. Mm -hmm. But we'll make it. So you've gone through quite a few stages in your life, and when you look back on your service to your country and then you look back on the help that you received with Katrina, what was your sense? Has there been a great change in your life particularly over the years with regards to the whole issue of growing up and being in the service and then going back to your home, to segregation? and then seeing the changes over the years, what was it like for you to experience those changes? Or have there been changes that are that dramatic with regards to the whole piece of, that you grew up with? I really cannot express that part. I, there's one thing I can say. I have lived life. And I've came through life. I've seen hard days, I've seen good days. But I've been here, I'm here 81 years old. I've lost so many friends. Thank God I'm alive. Mm -hmm. And thank God my wife's alive. This is about all I can say. I had to accept what was in the South. Mm -hmm. I had no other choice. The only way I had a choice was to leave the South. I didn't want to leave the South. I was born and raised there. My mother, father, sisters, and brothers are buried there. I'm going back home. It's the South. Will you go back home? I have, have an intention on going back at the end of this month. It's costing me money to get my home repaired. Mm -hmm. I've been swindled out of a lot of money. I've had contractors are supposed to do some work for me. I gave him $6,000, he'd gone. They didn't do the work? Then didn't do the work. I'm paid, paid. I'm paid to live, and I'm a, what else can I do? I'm 81 years old. What else can I do with whatever I have? I have a lot of friends. They're struggling, so. Would you consider staying here, or? No, ma'am. You miss the South. I want to go home, pick my wife. My wife wants to go home. Sure. If there's any way that my wife is going to die, forgive me for saying it, I want her to die home. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to die, die home. Sure. I can't do nothing now. I can't live here. I don't have a job. Sure. It's not, it's, I'm not living that neighborhood for nothing. There's feet. 
Basically. I get the best service, three meals a day. Hot, cold water, I get people to clean up the place. She gets her medicine three times a week, a day. Mm -hmm. When I get home, I'm gonna have to go through that again. I'm gonna have to find help, which I have called on the telephone to try and find help. Back in, in, New, Orleans, in New, Orleans. New Orleans, yes. The hospital she was going to is partially open, it's partially closed. To Brooklyn Hospital on Patania Street. But what has you, what has it been like for you this year in particular? We've had very different weather in New England. Um, we've had very warm weather in January, in February of this year, 2007, uh, especially this past few days. We've had very very cold weather. Knowing that you come from a climate that is certainly nothing like New England, what's, what's that adjustment been like for you? It's, it's all right once I've been in, stay inside. Yeah. But to go outside, I could take that one and put it in my freezer and my refrigerator. I don't need it. <laughs> this people here loves this weather. Yeah. I came, I wasn't born in this weather. I was born where in New Orleans when it, Get cold. It's the cold maybe three or four days. Sure. Five days. And the clothes that I have on, there's many things that when I get back to New Orleans, I'm going to have to take off. They're too warm. <laughs> I'll burn up in them. <laughs> but I, I, I love this city. I have received some of the best. Oh, I've, I've been. I, I, my wife and I cannot be treated no better than if it was in, in the city of New York. Mm -hmm. I've met the mayor here in Boston. I've been every crossing, everywhere I met, beautiful. Mm -hmm. The people are very wonderful. So people so have opened up to you to help the, you they and your wife? Up. They came to my, that gentleman there, Dan Brennan? Yes. They said, God sent you an angel. They sent a big angel to me when they sent him. Uh, I might say to the, those watching this, Dan Brennan is a friend who helped set up this interview today and brought you here today. And he's a friend from the Needham area. Getting back to your military experience, Joe, can you think of any memorable experiences or humorous things that happened that you might want to share with us? Well, the most humorous thing I think is when they tried to make a prize fight out of me. They tried to make you prize a prize, prize fighter? Did you have the abilities? I did. I had the ability to get out the ring to, to get away from it. I didn't want to be no prize fighter. I just was. But outside of that, we had a lot of just as a lot of fun, a lot of playing around, you know? Mm -hmm. But the service, to me, I loved it. I cannot, everything I say, I've seen a lot of comics, guys singing this and that, or, you know, it's, it's wonderful. I enjoyed it, really. And as far as for humorous, it to me was wonderful. It was wonderful. Well, while we finish up this interview, is there anything that we haven't asked you or any additional comments that you would like to make just to complete this interview for the public? I would just like to say it. I hope that the people who listen to this tape will see it. Please try and understand what I was saying or want to say. I'm not trying to say something on, wrong to no one. I don't want no, no American, I say American Negro, I did not say African American. I said no American Negro to think that I'm speaking for them, I'm speaking for myself. Sure. And I enjoyed this interview, and if there's any other personal question, I will be glad to answer. I have nothing to hide. Well, Joseph C. Clemens, we want to thank you very much for your participation in this program. I'd like to 
shake your hand and thank you for coming in today. And I thank you. And good luck on your move back to your home. And I thank you very much again. Okay, thank you. Thank you.